prepare yourselves for a battle of epic proportions between two titans. Feast upon their voices and revel in their words. This is Dueling Ogres. and welcome to episode 100. Thank you for joining us as always on this Centennial Monday evening, Earth Day, January 9th, 2017. I'm your host, Remington Hitchcock, and with me as always is my co-host, Brandon Full. Say hello, Brandon. Hey, Rem, it's great to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Episode 100! Woo! I'd like to say I missed you, Rem, but it'd be hard to miss you. Because <laughs> you're fat. I got a uh, a sitcom soundboard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. I'm sure that'll make this episode much better. I'm not going to use it the whole time. I know, surprising, but I decided I'm just going to use it sparingly, if I do use it any more than this. Yeah, yeah. Because I just, I care about you, yeah. and I care about our listeners, and I don't want to make this episode bad in any way. Yeah. Because yeah. you already make it bad enough. <sighs> I thought you were going to go with an awe sound there, but <laughs> uh, that's what I get for taking off my shirt. <laughs> All right. Let me put that away before I ever use it. <laughs> okay. So how have you been? I have been sick. Yes. But you wore your shirt and tie for today. I did. Just like episode 50. Just like episode 50. I dressed up. That I didn't remember about. <laughs> You're wearing the same old crap you wear every day. Every day because... Dirty is... pants, soaked yeah. in blood and semen. Yeah. A shirt just looks like it came off of a hobo's butthole. Uh, and I'm here dressed to the nines. Hey, listen, you know, hobos need warm buttholes too. I'm not, I'm not arguing... And I am robbing that from them by taking their butthole shirts. So... I hate hobos, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so you're doing this in a good way. I mean, good for me, bad for the hobos. But okay. that's how I want it. Okay. Well, you know, you're living your life, and I appreciate that. Mm. I admire mm. it. Thank you. How was your uh, How was your holiday season? We had Christmas, and we had New Year's, and... <laughs> All kinds of stuff. Yeah. This is, what, three weeks that we're back with this? Yeah, just about, I think. We took an extended, extended break. Yes. It was just going to be extended, but then it became double extended. Extra extended. Yes. Twice the extension. Double mint gum. Um, my holidays were good. Yeah? Yeah. I really have nothing of note to talk about with them. I mean, it was just Christmas, New Year's. I didn't do anything. Really, for either of them. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so I really had nothing of note as yeah. far as Christmas goes. I mean, it was a good Christmas. Yeah. New Year's was kind of a bust, but yeah, Christmas was nice, spending with family and all that stuff. Yeah. Did you get anything cool? Yeah, I got some neat stuff. The highlight, so I met my parents, and I'm opening Christmas presents, and all of my family, my immediate family comes over there. Yeah. And it's all just sort of a free-for-all. We just open our presents when we open them. Right. But I'm kind of going slow because I'm helping my daughter and I'm helping my nieces and nephews and stuff. Yeah. So my mom comes over and she looks at my pile of presents and she's like, have you opened that yet? Have you opened anything exciting yet? And I was like, I haven't really opened a whole lot of anything. And she's like, oh, Gene, which is my dad. Gene, get over here. He hasn't opened it yet. Bring the camera. Bring the camera. Yeah. And my mom's pointing to a present. She's like, open that one. You have to open that one. Oh, my gosh. Open that one. And they're so excited. So I'm thinking like, oh, this is interesting. So the presents wrapped clearly it's clothing it's in a clothing box you know Okay So they're excited faces and I don't know what I what to expect or what I'm expecting but I open it up and the very first thing I see is a thing of six fake mustaches <laughs> And then underneath that is a thing of six pairs of fake hillbilly teeth Uh-huh and then folded neatly under that and like I look up in my parents my mom especially her face is just so big and smiley is like a hyper realistic bloodhound dog mask. <laughs> like latex vinyl, full on. You see, I posted a picture of it. I know you've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Hyper realistic. And immediately my dad's like, snap, 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 taking pictures. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> like, there's no, th that's what was so strange is there was no 
basis for it outside of the fact that I it's don't know. weird gifts to give to Brandon. Yeah, give, because he's a weird dude. Give Bo the weird stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I've used it. Oh yeah, yeah, quite you, a bit actually. Yeah, you you've got the mileage out of it for sure. Yeah, you've I got, already have. You've got pictures up on your Instagram and stuff like that of everybody. Yeah, I think that's cute that your parents thought you would appreciate that and that they were very excited to give it to you. Yeah, that's I mean, I, I had a moment where I was like. Okay. Um, <laughs> but then the you, more I played with it, the more I thought about it. You've been adulting too long. That's the problem, Brandon. But then the more I played with it and the more I thought about it, I was like, no, this is a perfect gift. Like I said, I've gotten the mileage out of it. Yeah. So the other present that I opened from them that really springs to mind <laughs> is a dartboard. Okay. But it's like a plastic 3D dartboard that's magnetized. And it is Spider-Man, like the Spider-Man cartoon. Nice. Clearly cool. made for children. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's cool. That's funny. So I'm sh- my older brother's there. Obviously, I have a big family. But I'm showing my older brother, and I was like, does it say something about where mom and dad think I am mentally, that <laughs> this was one of the things they got me? And I show it to him, and he's like, well, I don't know. Um, you know, this is what they got me. And compares, and it's like a fucking wine tasting kit. (laughs) (laughs) With like different glasses and snifters and stuff. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. Good stuff. You're a child. I am. (laughs) (laughs) I can't say anything. Uh, I finished... I was more excited to give Ginger her gift that I made her uh-huh. than I was to get anything of mine almost. So it's 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 up on the wall here. It's a uh, Doctor Who RGB LED lit light box that I made with you've, my own two hands. You've talked about it in a couple episodes yeah. as you've progressed on it. I mean, it's super nice looking. Thank you. Just soaking it in now. Yeah, it's almost mesmerizing. Well, I like that... The way that the poster is kind of has like a metallic shininess to it. Uh huh. So when the light comes through, it gives it like almost a lithograph look. Yeah, it's they call it a silk poster. It's just it's a print on top of a fabric. So uh, okay. Yeah. So it's the fabric itself is rather porous, so the light really will shine through it. So yeah, um, took many hours of work. The first woodworking. Well, could have been that tough. <laughs> the first woodworking project that I've done it turned out pretty well. Do you think this is opening you up to the world of woodworking you've been wanting to get into for years? Uh yeah, I mean I would say so. The next project I'm going to do is um probably a bunch of shelving for the stuff that we got for Christmas because mm-hmm. we just we don't have anywhere to put it. I just need to put up shelves. Just buy shelves, dude. No, why just... should I buy them when I could Get buy the wood to free. build them? Yeah, but you'll have to buy the wood. No, I wouldn't have to buy the wood. Where are you going to get the wood from? Pallet wood. You can mm-hmm. get pallets for free anywhere. From where? Harbor Freight, for instance. Really? You yeah. Just, they just give you free pallets? Yeah. So the shelves you, you're going to make are going to be tiny then, right? No. If you're using pallet wood? No. A pallet's like a thing that things come on, right? Yeah. Like a pallet. Yeah. Like layered wood, a square. Yeah. Holes for a forklift. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's not that much wood. That's that's quite a bit of wood. (laughs) That's all the wood, Brandon. I don't know. I think you're wasting your time. Uh, Thanks. Good thing your opinion means fuck all to me. (laughs) Happy 100! Yay! We really come out with the hate on this one. Yeah. So, um, my holiday went well. One of the... uh, I got a lot of little kitchen gadgets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of kitchen gadgets. Um, I'll probably never use half of them, but hey, it's cool. I like them. But... Uh, one of the bigger gifts that Ginger got me was an actual Viking drinking horn. Oh, yeah. I saw that sitting on your end table. Yeah. Made in Norway, I think. Like, proper Vikings made it. And it's an actual, it's not a fake horn. It's a real horn. It's a real animal horn? Yeah. Real animal horn. Real leather bindings and stuff like that. Are you going to drink out of it ever? Probably. Probably wear it the next time we go to a Renaissance festival. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's safe to drink soda out of. I don't know. I mean, it's it's because I don't want to terrible on teeth. Yeah, I don't want to say varnished. It, I, I don't think that's the word that I'm looking for, but it's it, it's encased in, you know, a protective varnish sealant. 
you know? Yeah. So it'd probably be fine to put anything into, really. Just hand wash so it doesn't wear through the the encasement or yeah. whatever it is. Will you use it more for display or more for drinks? Uh, probably more for display. I mean, I just, I don't see, it's not like I would... It wouldn't behoove me to take it to work or anything. I was going to say, because you work as a salesman at a mattress firm. We've established this on the podcast before, right? That's not a secret. Um, Could you wear that at work around (sighs) your neck? I mean, I would wear it on my belt. It's it's made for a belt. Okay. Yeah. Would you have to explain to your boss why? He'd probably tell me to take it off. Oh, so you couldn't, you don't think you could actually wear it? No, I don't think he would enjoy the novelty of it mm-hmm. as much as i would it sounds like you need to start looking for a new career yeah yeah i should probably go into viking bed sales bed sales <laughs> viking mattresses <laughs> buy our mattresses oh i did they're made directly in sweden after i opened the dog mask and the spider-man thing you know i use the word incensed and that's a little strong i wasn't like Really, this is what they fucking got me? Because they got me a lot of stuff. Right, These yeah. were just the jokes. But it's still like in that moment, it kind of hit like, huh, okay. It's, is that what they really see of me? At, <laughs> see of me at 32 years old? Right. And then one of the nicer gifts that I got was a really nice ceramic Dutch oven. Uh, and as soon as I opened it, I giggled for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I realized like, oh, yeah, wait, this stuff is perfectly in my wheelhouse. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I get my older brother or my younger brother. And I'm like, hey, hey, what do you call it when you put a blanket over yours and somebody else's head and you fart under the blanket and make them smell it? And he's like, a Dutch oven. And I was like, look. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the box around. It says Dutch oven. He kind of got his chuckle, but I couldn't stop laughing. And it's so stupid. I know it was stupid. <laughs> but to this day, I don't know what a Dutch oven is or what it does. Oh, really? Yeah. It's just a ceramic pot. For- is yours ceramic? Or was it um, cast iron? Cast iron. Was it really heavy? Did it have a lot of heft to it? Was it black? It was green. It was bright green. It was bright like green. Like lime green. Okay. So, yeah, then it probably was ceramic then. Yeah. And you could bake ceramic. Yeah, it's, it's already pre-baked. So what it. is it for? Well, a cast iron Dutch oven, and, I mean, you can use it in the oven, but a cast iron Dutch oven was used a lot of the times for... Um, baking out on the trail, um, you could bake, you, you could dig a hole, put coals in there, and then kind of bury it and put the coals on top of it, so it would bake like an oven. That's what, um, you know, in the Old West, when they were traveling West, they used Dutch ovens quite a bit. So would I use it for, like, roasts and stuff? You could use it for roasts, you could use it for, you know, cooking beans, slow cooking beans, stuff like that. You could use it for uh, cornbread, there are recipes out there for dutch oven cornbread is it different from a crock pot yes uh it'll it'll cook a little faster than a crock pot okay for sure um does it hold farts yes i mean it can do you think you could cook a fart i think that a fart is primarily methane gas so just burn up okay okay here's 42 dutch oven recipes for braises braises bread and more Mm. are these literally just (laughs) pictures or what oh beef Bourguignon pot pie? I don't know how to say that word. Bourguignon? Bourguignon. Get the recipe off that. Bourguignon. Uh, Vinegar braised chicken and onions. Well, my parents like to get me, kind of like it sounds like your family, little kitchen doodads every year. Right, yeah. My favorite one they got me was this weird plastic contraption that was made to, you take hamburger patties and it's made to like inject things into the middle of them. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That's pretty cool though. Have you ever used it? No, I never used it. <laughs> and I ended up leaving it at my old apartment. So oh, that it. sucks. Which is unfortunate because I told my mom that when she gave it to me on the front, there was a picture of a hamburger injected with mac and cheese. <laughs> nice. And she was like, you get this, but you have to put make a hamburger with mac and cheese and tell me how it is. I'm so curious how that tastes. <laughs> And I never did, so I really let her down. So you just need to go over there and make her a hamburger with mac and cheese in it. Yeah. Like, but, really, yeah. all you have to do is just make mac and cheese. Like, do a crab mac and cheese, make it a little bit drier. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, just a little bit less liquid than what you would usually use. That way you can kind of ball it. And then you just wrap the patty around it and squish it down and bada bing, bada boom. Fry that up and... Hamburger with mac and cheese in it? Yep. 
Good stuff, man. Yeah, it doesn't sound bad. Real good stuff. I am going to send you that recipe. <laughs> this is a strange episode. It, it is. It's a strange episode so far. I mean... And really, we do have a theme as we go on. We have some stuff we're going to talk about. Yep. But... As we promised. I think episode 100, it's good. It's loose. Yeah, it's good. I don't know if it's interesting. We're going to make it a little long, I think. But fuck them. Yeah. I mean... Every one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ostracize our listeners. Are we talking about our listeners or the people who aren't listening? Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, so, okay, if we are talking about both, then do we want to fuck our listeners in a good way? I guess so, yeah. Fuck That's their, a good way to spin fuck it. Fuck their ear holes with knowledge Sound and, and fun. dicks. Sound dicks. <laughs> hmm. Well, we now know that episode 100 is not safe for work. Yeah, we've <laughs> earned that mature rating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess we can say all the things that they can't say. Yeah. On, uh, what, R-rated? Anything, really. I mean, none of this should be heard by anybody else. Genitals! <laughs> <laughs> so, we do have a theme episode <laughs> today. Let's just move this right along here. That's poppycock. Poppy, <laughs> Poppycock. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it would be uh interesting uh, not only have we not done a theme episode for quite a while now werewolves um, actually werewolves. well yeah that werewolves. was just like two months ago that's true but that was like holiday style yeah and i don't know if i count that because i was calling in so i don't think it was as great of an episode as it could be <laughs> i mean you need to get past that stigma. That well, I need to stop shit talking our episodes too. <laughs> that too. That would be nice. You <laughs> douche. You dick bag. It was a good episode. Yeah. Um, but we thought it'd be My cool. Stuff was good. We <laughs> shut up. Let me get through this. <laughs> we thought it would be cool to do an episode on uh, astrology, horoscopes, zodiac stuff. Um, kind of because, you know, that's kind of a divination thing. It's kind of a look toward the future. Mm-hmm. And I, I told you early on, Brandon, that I thought that 2017 was going to be a really good year for the podcast, Dueling Ogres. You know, the, the Adam Down banner, I guess you could say. I think it's going to really, like, we've grown a lot this past year, and I think this year is going to be an even bigger step forward. Okay. So that's really why I thought, you know, doing an astrology episode would be cool to just kind of get an idea of, you know, future telling, fortune telling, you know, looking towards the future, getting an idea of what might come mm-hmm. is kind of a nod, even though neither one of us are really like into that sort of thing. I think it'd be cool to look at the history of where that came from and then move on with our year with this positive vibe. Oh, you wanted us to bring positive stuff to this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to redo. Hold on. I'm going to have to just get rid of all this. Okay. That was some real good Foley work Let's there. <laughs> this is real good Foley work, Brandon. I'm proud of you. Thumbs up. <laughs> that was not so good. That was my, not so my good. Foley on a thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up. That was pretty good. Thanks. That was that was a thumbs up. Or it the could have been a lighter was... too. <laughs> yeah. That's Spider Man. Yeah. That's that, like is, weirdly sexual at this is, point. Is this, is this what we have become? Yeah. We're not even getting to the astrology stuff. Why we're just should gonna we? make, Who cares? We're just going to make Foley noises all day. It's we a put, celebration of we us. We put days of work into doing astrology notes and we're just bullshit. This is a celebration of us and this is a celebration of our listeners. So fuck them all. <laughs> <laughs> no, so we are discussing this, taking an eye towards the future and we have left our fate and the fate of this podcast up to the stars. So how do we want to get started on this there, Brandon? Do we just do you want me to just go ahead and launch into what is astrology? Okay, so Remington and I haven't really compared notes. Right. This is gonna be a crapshoot. A lot of times when we do theme episodes, especially the last few, minus the werewolf episode, we would share notes. Astrology, going into this, we will say, as I typically say on most episodes, themed episodes that we do, obviously we're not experts. And there's only so much we can cover. 
So there's going to be a lot of stuff that we miss. If you know about astrology and we're missing something major, leave a message on the Facebook page. Call us at the number Remington will give at the end. Anything like that to help us out. But don't take all of this as us being scientists and saying we're covering everything. Right. We took a very hot and cold, touch and go sort of approach to the information that we gathered. Yeah. So we're covering astrology. Remington, you got astrology from a couple different uh, areas, right? Yeah, I have uh, like the the beginning histories of astrology and zodiac stuff, and then a couple of different civilizations to to cover. Okay, so the term astrology starting out comes from Latin astrologia, meaning astronomy, the science of the heavenly bodies. Gotcha. And what do you have as far as what is astrology goes there? Uh, today's version of astrology seems to focus on the divination. Of the, this is straight from the Webster's definition. Uh, the divination of the supposed influences of the stars and planets on human affairs and terrestrial events by their positions and aspects. But it didn't always used to be that way. Astrology, ancient astrology, was more uh, akin to astronomy as we now know it. So more like the study of the celestial bodies and how that connected to like earth sciences like seasons and natural disasters and other planetary events Mm -hmm. so that's that's where we're at like what it is now versus what it used to be and that's what we're really focusing on correct yeah we're focusing more on the history of how it how it came to be what it is today okay i guess okay so because there's more that i could say on what you just read there Uh but we'll go ahead and just go through with the notes that we have and discuss that and then any points i have i'll I think it'll be fine, honestly, for you to to just go in. Yeah. Okay. I just don't know what all your notes cover. So talking about how astrology then is what astronomy is today. Right. Is kind of true and kind of not true. Astronomy, as we know, proper astronomy was, I think, 1600s is when the astronomy that we now consider what it is really took hold. Before that, astrology was the study of the heavenly planets and bodies. But there was also a belief that the movements of those not only affected the seasons and the weather, but also affected humans Yeah, in a lot of different ways. So up until the 1600s, all of those things were folded in together and just assumed to be true. So now we have this astrology where, you know, you look at your birth chart, you look at this or that and say, oh, you're born under the sign of cancer. So you're stubborn. You're this, that, X, Y, and Z. Right. That was just assumed before astronomy proper really took hold gotcha so really yeah all the way up until the 1600s it was just kind of assumed to still be the all the astrology that we kind of talk about as the past yes that that's a way later than i thought (laughs) to Mm. be honest it could be the 1400s okay i could be give or take 200 years gotcha i mean 200 years isn't that much to be fair yeah well and the idea that the stars affected who you were In the sense that astrology believes now, not all of that was entirely believed either. Right. Like I said, it's very convoluted. There's going to study the history of astrology. You know, I assume this would be kind of a fun episode about zodiacs and stuff. Right. Literally, the notes are just the history of humans looking at stars. Yeah. (laughs) Is what astrology ended up being. Yeah. Which uh, kind of gives credence to the, but you're right. I mean, it has it, it's wrapped a whole lot more into the not just how it affects the planet, but how it affects human beings as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, so let's go ahead and dive into like I'll just get started real quick on the where astrology came from. Yes, and you can jump in with what you have on that as well. Aliens, aliens. is where astrology yes. came from. Aliens came down. Uh, from the heavens to mm-hmm. deliver astrology to the Sumerians. Okay. Okay, only part of that is true. <laughs> it was the Babylonians. It was the, the Sum- No, it was definitely the Sumerians. Okay, so Sumeria came before Babylon. Sumerians are they they are the first civilization. Civilization, right? Yes. In the Mesopotamia? Yes, in the Mesopotamian area. <laughs> in the Mesopotamia. In the Mesopotamia. Yes. Is that where the river comes from that everybody talks about? The Cradle of Life. Yeah. It was all in the Mesopotamian region where the uh, Tigris and Euphrates were. Okay. Yes. So if that's what you're, you're, the Cradle of Civilization, that's 
what you're talking yeah. about there. Which is now, what, modern day Iran, Iraq? Yes. Okay. Yes. And this is where I got this sort of uh, timeline of who kind of came first. We've got the Sumerians, the Akkadians, uh, and the Sumerians were like the first urban civilization. Uh, they're the ones credited with inventing writing, and this was somewhere around 3000 BCE, and they were powerful until about 2300 BCE. The Babylonians came um, in the late, well, I guess it would have been the early 1900s BCE. So, because, you know, when you get into BCE, the numbers are backwards. <clears throat> yeah. So, you kind of have to get used to talking that way. Yeah, I got very confused <laughs> in doing my notes. When it would say, like, 3rd century era BCE. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I had to look it up when they were like, oh, 3rd century. I was like, oh, wait, what is, is that? Is, is that, that 300 fourth? BCE? So that means 300 to 200 BCE? Yeah, okay. So what's 3rd millennia then? Oh, that'd be 3000 BCE. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it took a little time getting used to that. So, yeah, they're, uh, like I said, they're credited with inventing writing uh being the first civilization proper uh and they're also credited with just a ton of knowledge that was gathered and written down for future generations to to look back upon so they really they knew the importance of having documentation about what they have learned yeah um what do you have on the babylonians then because the babylonians come before the Assyrians in the scheme of things, and I'm going to talk about Ashurbanipal, who was an Assyrian king. Okay, so the stuff I have on the Babylonians actually isn't a whole lot. Okay, that's fine. Uh, the Babylonians are considered, this is from the American Federation of Astrologers. So this is where I got a lot of the Babylonian information from. Gotcha. The Babylonians are considered the first organized astrology practitioners. Dates from the second millennium B.C., Culmination of beliefs appeared in a series of tablets called the Enuma An Enu Enlil. Yeah. I'm probably butchering that. <laughs> the Enuma Anus. The Enuma Anus. <laughs> so from what I could read from the Babylonians, they built upon the Sumerians. Because the Sumerians had like a, a wheel, didn't they? Like an astrological wheel that sort of already broke up the sky a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I don't know if it was a full on proper zodiac. Which I guess we should go ahead and give the definition of a zodiac while we're at it. Um, again, going back to Webster, the zodiac is an imaginary band in the heavens centered on the ecliptic that encompasses the apparent paths of all the planets and is divided into 12 constellations or signs, each taken from astrological purposes to extend 30 degrees of longitude. So basically what that means is Wherever the sun sits in the sky, within 30 degrees, whatever constellation happens to be within that is whatever the, whatever the sign is for that 30 degrees of movement of longitude. Right. And that's split up into 12 sections. And that comes from the Babylonians were the first civilization to have a 12-month year. Yeah. They had a 12-month year. Each month was 30 days. So they did a lot of stuff in 12s to keep track of dates and times. Obviously, astrology was originally used when keeping track of the sun to know when to plant crops, to know when to bring stuff in, when to hoard food versus when to plant food, when to hunt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So astrology has been huge since humans were able to understand anything about stars. Like, hey, when that thing moves over here, it's going to probably be cold in a couple of weeks and I'm going to die if I don't get some first. Right. So the Enuma Anu Enlil was a collection of 68 to 70 tablets that they had written down that outlined behaviors of the moon, solar appearances, and markings, as well as weather. With earthquakes, and from what I could read, it also says special attention was devoted to thunder. Oh, really? So they wrote a lot about thunder, I guess. Huh. I would assume because thunder seems more ominous. Yeah. More portentous. And what you were saying about the Zodiac, I guess, if we've gotten into that, they have what's called the Celestial Equator. And this is how we create what is considered the Zodiac now. And if you were to take a line... More from specifically, the, the Tropical Zodiac is what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. If you were to imagine the Earth's equator, and it's a line, 
And then that line projects straight up into the sky, just going on indefinitely. Right. That's the celestial equator. Okay. So our equator cuts the sky into 30 degree points. Gotcha. So there's the 12 zodiac signs each has 30 degrees. So together that makes a full 360. Gotcha. So that's how they divide up the sky and that's how they decided that they were going to be 12. Okay. Cool. So that so that's what you have on the Babylonians then? Yes. Okay. So continuing onward in time then, uh we arrive in Assyria. And Assyria had a good long reign as the the dominant power within Mesopotamia. Um up to around like I think it was 619 BCE. So during the last section of that um and you may have heard of this guy's name, Ashurbanipal. Yeah. Um, he was a... a Solely from the They Might Be Giants song. Yeah, which is uh, awesome. The Mesopotamians, go look that up. I love that song. I listened <laughs> to it like half a dozen times while I was doing these notes. Yeah. But uh, Ashurbanipal was the Assyrian king from about 668 to 627 BCE. Uh, he was known for a lot of different things like being credited as the only Assyrian king who knew how to read and write. He was um, originally not supposed to be the king. His older brother was going to be the king. I believe he died in battle or something. So he, Ashurbanipal was being trained in, in the knowledge arts. He was the only one who knew how to read and write? Yes. The only, the only king or the only person? The only king to be credited with being able to read and write. Oh, okay. So the other kings just, you know, they didn't, find that it was necessary don't need to know yeah i don't need to know how to read and write that's what i've got scribes for oh, yeah? you think i need to read that yeah is that is that what uh assyrian yeah that's 100 percent accurate assyrian accent yeah good good um <laughs> <laughs> he was also he was not only known for that but he was also known for his brutality towards his enemies oh uh, good where <laughs> so he read enemies, a lot of books on it yeah I guess. enemies of the state um i think there was one particular story where he basically ran uh i think it was a persian king or a persian prince or something through the jowls with a pin and chained him up like a dog jesus yeah so <laughs> just stuff like that you know real real quality family stuff yeah there but his most historical accomplishments uh can be credited to the creation of the library at Nineveh. Uh, Nineveh was the Assyrian capital, and he sent many scribes out to collect information, ancient information, ancient Babylonian and Sumerian texts, and bring them back to the library. He was, he was very interested in learning as much as he could. I mean, he was very much a scholarly king. He wanted to have this information. He knew the value of it. When he wasn't chaining his enemies up like dogs. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have him bringing all of this information in, and that is ultimately where we find the information that the Sumerians and Babylonians had in ancient Mesopotamia. Oh, so that's how he tied it in. Yes. All of that was lost until... Ashurbanipal found it. Yes. Okay. So Ashurbanipal, well, it wasn't necessarily lost. It was just not in one place. So he brings it all into one place. Well, then the Babylonians come in uh, during, you know, after Ashurbanipal was dead. He wasn't, he wasn't in charge during the time. But the Babylonians came in to Nineveh. They sacked Nineveh. They burned the library. And the reason why they think this, why scholars think this, is uh, in the 19th century, excavations in that area revealed where Nineveh was and also the library of it. And they could tell that it was probably burned because the tablets themselves that have this information mm -hmm. uh, looked like they had been proper baked. So not like, not like baked to be finished, but the tablets themselves were like over baked. Okay. So that's why they think that the library had burned because they had over baked their tablets. Yes. So when they got there and they saw their tablets were overbaked, they were like, fuck it, just burn it all down? No. No, the Babylonian, the Babylonians sacked Nineveh. Yeah, yeah, I got and that. And burned the library, mm -hmm. which caused the tablets that Ashurbanipal had brought okay, in. Okay, so you were saying why this is why they think they have evidence that it was burnt. Yes. Okay, I thought you were saying this is why they think the Babylonians decided to burn it. <laughs> no, <laughs> They were sorry. like, oh, look what they did to our tablets. <laughs> So the Babylonians... Better sack it then, huh? 
bit burnt, right? <laughs> right, right. And I mean, you know, Babylon, all of that area, each, you know, the Syrians, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, they went back and forth in power struggles over thousands of years. You know, sometimes it was Assyria. Sometimes it was Acadia that was the dominant power. Sometimes it was Babylon. Babylon, it, from the sound of it, and again, we're not historians, but Babylon, from the sound of it, had two major movements. Um, you had the Sumerians and then the Akkadians, but from the sound of it, Babylon played a big part in it because that what you were saying about the Babylonians kind of happened before Assyria came into power. Okay. And, I mean, Babylon is, is pretty well known for just in even in layman's history. Like, if you say Babylon, people know you're talking about an ancient culture. Yeah, well, I mean, that's whenever, uh, like, end times prophets talk about, especially Christian revelations, but a lot of different revelations is that once everything's over, they're going to build a new Babylon. Yeah. That's, like, what they aspire to as far as there's going to be a new ba- Babylon on Earth, a new Babylon. Right. What is it about cultures fucking burning other cultures' libraries and books and shit? <laughs> I don't that know. That is so aggravating to me. Yeah, I know, isn't it? Like, why would you not want to keep history? Is it just, do you think it's partially because as the victor, it's one of those like 1984, if you control the future, you control the past kind of things where you're just trying to wipe out all of their knowledge, I just mean, burn it to overwrite it with yours? I guess to that end, history is written by the victors, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't hold on to the previous person's history in my mind. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I definitely agree with you. I'm yeah. just wondering what it is about invading it may not be as it may be just as simple as you know what fuck Nineveh we're just gonna burn it you know it could have been just that yeah potentially they have a library uh, who gives a shit just burn the whole thing but there's a huge history of invading countries doing that to other countries yeah doing I mean the library of Alexandria yeah happened to that yeah um oh even when Britain attacked America during the Revolutionary War there were some libraries that Britain burnt down when they took them over hmm like, I know they burnt down the White House, and they they burnt yeah. down um, part of some library we had. I mean, we have the Library of Congress now, or the National Archives. Is it the same thing? I'm not sure. I don't know. Whatever. But yeah, they burnt down a different one first. And yeah. this was like fucking 1700s, right? Revolutionary War? 1600s? Yeah. yeah. Whenever it was. Well, even more recently with the uh, those museums getting um, sacked and, and things getting stolen and destroyed. In the Middle East? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember... It was a couple of years ago. Yeah, we talked about it on an episode. Yeah, a couple. Of I think with Ben. Yeah, when he was on. Yeah, maybe so. So yeah, I don't. I don't know why they do that either. Really, it's weird. Maybe books are dumb. Like maybe, maybe we're in the minority here. <laughs> maybe. And we books just need to realize stupid. that books are stupid. Mm, that's true. And they should burn all of the authors. Yes, they should burn all of them. Or cripple at least cripple their hands. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that there's so they... much technology now, and voice boxes. Yeah. Tie their hands to their voice boxes. Okay. Hello. That way, every time they talk, their little fingers would wiggle. Yeah, I like that. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, going from Mesopotamia, then, in the history of it all, it's believed that the Mesopotamian ideals of astrology were brought to Egypt during the Persian invasion of Egypt. And that became merged with their own decantic astrology decantic yes what is decantic uh decantic astrology is basically and from the sound of it as an aside um it sounds like you know the babylonians you said were the first to have that 12 month sort of deal Mm -hmm. um the egyptians had a very similar system it's it's probably likely that there were already babylonian influences on egyptian astrology well and the babylonians emerged from the sumerians so there's a good yeah. chance that the Sumerians had already started to develop a 12-month calendar. Right. As sure. they were developing calendars, you know? Sure. Uh, so when it comes to decantic astrology, they have found multiple collections of paintings and hieroglyphs that depict decantic astrology having uh, been divided into 12 months with each month containing 30 days. And then the remaining five days of that 12 months is just tacked on at the end of the year. Each month was further divided into 10 or 10 day weeks, thus giving us a deacon, which is literally means a group of 10. 
Okay. So each Egyptian month had three weeks in it of ten days. Okay. Ten day weeks. So instead of it being more of a seven day, four week structure like we have now, three weeks, ten days in a week. So that's just the Egyptians being difficult. <laughs> or easy. I mean, isn't that math a whole lot easier? To have three ten day weeks instead of yeah. seven four day weeks? Yeah, so that's no. thirty six weeks in a year times 10 gives you 360 days tack on the five days at the end yeah that's easier than whatever we have now no with the leap years and stuff well even not even with the leap years we've got 30 days in november april june and september all the rest have 31 except for february yeah but <laughs> egyptians didn't have that cool rhyme yeah i know that rhyme will get you laid <laughs> <laughs> so uh the use of this calendar year can be observed on ceilings of tombs and inside sarcophagi dating back as early as around 2100 BCE. They used astrology in much the same way that other ancient cultures, observing planetary and heavenly shifts that affected the cycles of the world around them. This allowed them to predict seasons and weather patterns, prepare for droughts, planning for agriculture like we've talked about. The spiritual side still existed alongside the astronomical aspects with uh, rituals and omens taking place during celestial, celestially relevant events. When the Persians invaded Egypt in 1525 BCE, they brought that Mesopotamian astrology with them that had become more etched in stone, all puns aside. Literally, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had brought that with them, and it mingled with that decantic astrology, which included, at that point, the zodiac system. So before that, the decantic didn't have a zodiac system. Okay, it, it wasn't it wasn't relegated to the thirty degree separation like the Mesopotamians had found over that time. Yeah, the thirty degree stuff is considered modern Western astrology. Yeah, it has its roots in Babylonian, and then I'm sure as you continue, you're going to be getting to the Greeks. Actually, no, no, you have Greeks, don't you? No. Oh, do you not have Greek stuff? I thought you did. No, I don't have stuff as far as the Greek Empire. I just have the Greek influence on the Zodiac. Okay, and that's fine. That's what I was more talking about. Because okay. that's really what we use today. I mean, as far as language goes, we use the Greek symbols overall. We have been using the same Zodiac since the Greek Empire. Yeah. To today. Like, yeah. no name changes, no date changes, the exact same Zodiac. Right. So we'll we'll come back to that a little bit then, because eventually the Egyptian astrology gathers in the Greek stuff as well. So uh, 525 BC, Persians evade Egypt. They bring the Mesopotamian astrology with them. Uh, that mingles, which introduces the zodiac to the system, and that becomes that new amalgamation. They also brought like the amalgamation. What? Huh? Amalgamation. What did I say? Algamation. Oh, did I? Weird. Okay. Because um, I have it spelled right there. That brought um, celestial events like eclipses and stuff along with it as well. So that amalgamation became known as horoscopic astrology, okay. which is probably where we get that horoscope word verbiage from. Yeah. In 332 BCE, Egypt was conquered by Alexander the Great, thus integrating Greek astrological traditions, forming the Hellenistic Egyptian astrology. It's a long history. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I mean, yeah, I'm trying to squeeze it in because we don't want this to be like a super long episode. Just real touch and go stuff like we said before. Yeah. We're just touching on different timeline events. So that's really what I have up to is basically up to the Greek stuff okay. where we see Greek being integrated in. And then from there, I figured I could do just like talking about the differences between what we kind of see today versus different um, civilizations. Like I've got China notes. I've got I've got information on Burmese astrology, which is, looks really, really convoluted. OK, <laughs> um, I have stuff on Mayan. Well, do you want me to and Hindu? Do you want me to hit some of this? Greek stuff first? Yes. And then you'll go back and then we'll finish? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the term Zodiac comes from Latinized ancient Greek, okay. which comes from Zodiacos Kyklos, which means circle of little animals. Okay. 
because the That's 12 super things adorable. besides um one of them libra libra is the only one that's not an animal the rest of them are animals okay libra is the scales okay yeah uh the modern zodiac begins with aries at the placement of the sun at the vernal equinox so whenever you see the zodiac and they say you know i'm a virgo so virgos are from august 22nd to september 22nd okay going into this i didn't know well how do they decide this shit right the dates you mean yes so it's all based off of what we were saying with the 30 degrees and all of it comes down to the vernal equinox which is the first day of spring okay so that starts with aries and what it is is that again if you go back to the celestial equator whenever it turns the vernal equinox which is where the sun rises directly above above us during spring i think that's how they decide that it's the vernal equinox yeah i think so aries is the constellation that the sun is in so aries is the proper beginning of the zodiac because the beginning of the zodiac starts march 20th between march 20th and march 22nd depending okay so it all is based off of the vernal equinox and then all of the signs are related to the four classical elements that was another thing i wondered is you know when i've looked at my zodiac it'll say like Virgo, you are an earth sign. Pisces, you're a water sign. Yeah. Like you're what, Ram? Remind me again. I'm a Capricorn. And I okay. think I'm earth or water. You're an earth sign also. So I was looking up why we use those elements. Okay. Why things are earth, air, fire, and water. Apparently, as long as they've done science and like tried to figure out not just astrology, not just things in the sky, but things on earth. Yeah. How chemicals and things like that work. Right. There's been considered the five classic elements. Yeah. Earth, wind, fire, water are the four. And then the fifth one is aether. Uh Uh-huh. Which is, they for whatever reason, they don't associate that with the stars. But aether is things like gravity, um, things that happen around us on Earth that we don't understand. Gotcha. Most civilizations have this, even um, like the Asian cultures, Chinese they also have this, except it's changed a little bit. Instead of earth, it's wood. Yes, yes. So um, the wood. Instead of wind, it's something else. But it's basically the air. same thing. It's air instead of wind. And in metal. Bab- yeah. In Babylonian times, the elements originally related to the weather of the months the signs fell in. Okay. So if I'm going to say Aries, Aries is a fire element. Okay. At one point, Aries was the signifier of the beginning of spring. Right. Spring's hot. Aries is a fire sign. The next one's Taurus. Taurus is an earth element. Earth is when you're going to uh, grow your crops. Right. So that's where those elements originated from forever ago. Gotcha. And uh, I guess from a mythology standpoint, Aries, you know, Aries was the god of war, which usually meant, again, using fire to sack your enemies, you know, burning their places down. Yeah. Uh, You could kind of get that. So that that could be one of the reasons why they chose Aries. Of course, they wouldn't have chosen necessarily um, Hef- Hephaestus. Yeah, Hephaestus is the god who brought fire to humanity. Well, see, Aries is, there's the constellation. Yeah. Aries is also Mars, right? Isn't Aries the Greek yes. Mars? Mm-hmm. Mars is visible. Gotcha. So um, there's yeah. a lot of... There's a lot of weird crossover with astrology. I mean, I, I really got into these notes, but it would hit a certain point as I was getting into like the actual astronomical facts about astrology yeah. that my eyes just crossed <laughs> when it was like, right. but when it's 30 degrees, the longitude of this and that and that and blah, blah, blah. Like I had to look up what vernal equinox was. Right. That's fucking astronomy 101, I assume. <laughs> I still don't understand 100% why it's the vernal equinox. Right. <laughs> i think it's the equinox is when the sun's directly above us i think or something i think so i think you're right um so do you want me to go ahead and run through the zodiac signs here real quick the western zodiac signs yeah go ahead okay so i'm gonna read these as fast as possible basically what it is is i'm gonna name the sign i'm gonna name the element the dates what it is based on oh my god and a few traits of each person born under these signs okay i grabbed a couple good and a couple bad all of this is from the uh fantastic site zodiac-signs-astrology.com okay gotcha aries fire element march 20th to april 19th based on 
Chrysomalus, the Golden Fleece Ram, the one that yeah. mm-hmm. Hercules had to do stuff with. Uh, I don't think it was Hercules, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, leaders, Headstrong, Reckless, Independent. Taros, Earth Element, April 19th to May 20th. Based on the Cretan Bull, the Daddy of the Minotaur. Okay. Uh, Taurus is our reliable, practical, ambitious, materialistic, possessive. Gemini, Air Element, May 20th to June 20th, based on the twins Castor and Pollux. Energetic, witty, adaptable, impulsive, devious, indecisive. This is going to be a long time. Do you want me to read all these? Because this is going to be longer than I thought. <laughs> uh, cancer is based off of... I'm not going to read the dates. I'm just going to read them in order. From yeah. Yeah, that's probably uh, The elements go fire, earth, air, water. I ended on Gemini's air. So from here, cancer is going to be water and then it restarts at fire. So okay. whatever from there. Each one's 30 days. Okay. Uh, cancer, this is my favorite of them. Okay. Cancer is based on Carcanos, which is a giant crab. Yes. And Carcanos' story, do you know what Carcanos' story is? No, I don't. Hercules had to fight the Hydra. Yes. And oh, what is the what's the Greek goddess of love? Aphrodite? Yes. Aphrodite sent Carcanos, a crab, to distract Hercules so the Hydra would kill him. Okay. So this crab went up and pinched Hercules on the toe. And Hercules just turned around and stomped it to death. <laughs> and then she, she for that crab's bravery, made him a constellation. Well, good job, Aphrodite. You are the definition of a dumb woman. <laughs> wow. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut that out. <laughs> uh, cancers are dependable but moody. Leo is based on the Nemean lion, a uh, lion that Hercules just strangled to death at one point. <laughs> yeah, uh, they are confident and pretentious. Hercules was a real prick. Wasn't yeah, he was. <laughs> a lot of these are based off of Hercules stories too. Huh. So there's got to be more. I mean, I like Greek mythology, but I'm not, you know, a Greek mythology expert by any stretch. Right. Hercules and his trials must really mean something important in Greek history. Yeah. For so many of these things to be based off of. Yeah. Her- Hercules. Uh, next is Virgo, the best sign. Based on Astria, the virgin goddess of innocence and purity. Astria? Yeah. That sounds good, too. Okay. Is Astria the name? I think it's Astria. It's A-S-T-R-A-E-A. So I assumed Astria. Oh, no. No, you're probably right. Uh, Virgos are... There's nothing bad about Virgos. They're all good. We're reliable, observant, precise, skeptical, cold. Uh huh. Nothing amazing. Nothing bad about fantastic that. Fantastic lovers, great podcasters. Uh huh. The best of friends. <laughs> uh, Libras are based on the scales of justice held by Themis. They're diplomatic and superficial. Scorpio is based on Scorpius, a scorpion that killed Orion. Or also, and I found conflicting reports here, that Scorpio could also be based on the classic 80s hair band, the Scorpions, Uh who wrote the song Rocky Like a Hurricane. Gotcha. And they are loyal but manipulative. Sagittarius (laughs) is based on the centaur archer Chiron. They are independent and unemotional. Capricorns, based on the Sumerian god of wisdom and water. Yeah, we are. You guys are dictatorial, inhibited, conceited, distrusting, and unimaginative. (laughs) I think you're making that up. No, I specifically for you wrote down only bad ones. Right. Yeah. I, um, I mean, let's go through these real quick, though, for you. Right. This I knew oh. even as I was writing this list that this was going to be a bad idea and take a million years to read. So <laughs> let's just I'll do the last two real quick. Uh, Aquarius is based off of a water bearer named Ganymede. Yes. Whose story is hilarious. He was a little water boy, little cute little water boy yeah. that Zeus fell in love with and just brought him up to Olympus to like hang out screw around with and give water to the gods okay yeah he just came down like you're a pretty little boy why don't you come with me <laughs> okay god and then pisces which is based on ichthyocentaurs which is the upper body of a human lower oh yeah i like this one too at what point did the greeks just realize like hey we're just throwing shit together for no reason <laughs> this is the ichthyocentaur the upper body of a human the lower front of a horse fishtail, and lobster claw horns. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. So let's go back to you on this Capricorn thing, Rem. Okay, Brandon. Would you say, <laughs> we'll go through each of these and we'll, we'll uh, suss them out here. And see. Okay. okay. I did put a couple good ones, so okay. I'll start with the good ones. Responsible. Okay. Would you say you're responsible? Yeah. I would say you're responsible. Uh, loyal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say mostly loyal. <laughs> mostly? Patient. Do you have patience? I feel like you lack patience. 
you feel like I lack patience? Yeah. I wouldn't say that you're, I wouldn't describe you as impatient, but I would say that you're not particularly patient. I would say that your patience is at a zero. If you were a character sheet, you would have no ranks in patience. You wouldn't have any negatives, but you would have no positives in patience. I respectfully disagree. How are you patient? Brandon, I don't know if anybody would have put up with you as a friend for as long as I have. You're the only person who's still my friend. (laughs) Patience. (laughs) Patience or loyalty. It goes hand in hand in some cases. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, dictatorial. I'll give you that one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I will give you that. We'll both take that one. Uh, Inhibited? Inhibited. I I would say in a lot of ways you are inhibited. You have inhibitions. I I would compare it to you not being very adventurous. You're inhibited. It's hard for you to let loose. Mm, okay. I mean, in certain ways, you'll take off your shirt and pants in front of anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you don't like to go on adventures. I'm I'm very hobbitous. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that I don't like to go on adventures. It's just that I put responsibility before going on adventures. Usually. Mm. So that yeah. sounds like inhibitions to me. Yeah. Uh, conceited. I I suppose in some ways I am. I think to be fair, though, I think that most people are conceited. I think that people think that the their way is the right way, regardless. It's just how much you push that on somebody. See, I think confidence and being conceited, it can be viewed both ways. Yeah, you know the same things that you could argue you are conceited about could also be argued that you are just confident about them. You know what I mean? I suppose. I think, like, let's see if I can find an example. Um, So you're having trouble finding an example. That's unimaginative. That's the last thing (laughs) on here for Capricorns. uh, I I used to be way more imaginative than I am now. I don't know what happened where I just, maybe I just started moving too analytically. Mm -hmm. So I kind of lost my ability to imagine. Yeah. When I get there, though, I still come up with some neat stuff. But I've never been able to come up with the thing, like... When you see somebody who, when you see an artist who has or has not smoked a whole lot of weed or something, and they're doing all these crazy colors and weird, you know, swirly shapes and stuff like that, and just creating this abstract art. Abstract has never been my thing. Yeah. I just, I lack the ability to be abstract. I would say that you create in like the same way that Frankenstein created Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. Yeah. You create by knowing what you want the outcome to be and taking every step to do it that way. Yeah. And damn the consequences. <laughs> and distrusting. Are you distrusting? No, no. I'm not distrusting. I will trust anybody at face value until they've wronged me. So what do you feel about these descriptions here? I think a pr- I think they're fairly accurate. Fairly accurate? Yes. Okay, let's do me real quick. Okay. And I'll just get your opinion on these. Analytical? Yeah, I would say you're you're more analytical now than you used to be. I've always been analytical. You didn't show it as much. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, patient? No. <laughs> um, reliable. <laughs> I think you just answered yeah, your own question there. Observant? Yeah, you're pretty observant. Precise? No, not really. <laughs> no. Skeptical? Yes. Skeptical. Uh, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical about some things. Yeah. But there's a lot of conspiracy theories, I believe. I wouldn't say I, I would say I'm more pessimistic than skeptical. Eh, uh, those kind of, those kind of go hand in hand too, though. You yeah. Know, pessimism comes with skepticism. Well, and here's something that. Case bes- in point, you, you had, you had some observations about. Your NASA review Mm -hmm. that you thought maybe was that skepticism. I think, yeah. From from my point of view, what was happening, it was more like, eh, it just seems like they're just trying to tell you what it is. See, I feel like that was me being analytical and you being dictatorial (laughs) (laughs) by telling me to call you and you would role play with me. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Well, I, you know, I just want to make sure that you're, you're mining the best rocket fuel you can. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's really what it's all about. Yep. Hitting those rocket fuel numbers. Yep. <laughs> uh, fussy. Would you say I'm fussy? Uh, I hate the word fussy. Yeah, I know. I think of like a baby that's teething, right? Yeah, exactly. Would you compare me to a baby that's teething? The, no, but I wouldn't compare anybody to a baby that's teething <laughs> except a baby that's teething. It's kind of its own thing. 
I would say I can be fussy. Really? If you were to use fussy not as like a teething baby, but like somebody who kind of just grouses. Uh huh. I grouse a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I grouse good. about little stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's the fucking line at the gas station. Yeah. Oh, I guess if, if you can call that fussy, then I'm fussy too. Oh, yeah. You're super fussy. Yeah. I'm totally fussy. I'm uh, totally you're teething fuss. constantly. Yes. Um, and totes fuss. would you call me cold? <sighs> yeah. A little. Well, you're colder than I am. Mm-hmm. I'm much more warm and welcoming than you are. You're very, you're very reserved because I was going to say standoffish, but I don't, I don't want, you're not standoffish. In most cases, mm-hmm. but you're definitely more reserved. You're much more. You're much harder to get um, trust. With. Trust. Yeah. You know, and that falls back to the skepticism. You know, I think that more often than not, and you may not be wrong, that if you meet somebody new, the initial thought is, "What can I get out of this person?" Mm. See. I feel like what can I get out of this person or, or makes what, me sound awful. What no, no, can no. this person offer me? Yeah, but uh, I mean from their end. Oh, okay. Where they're saying, what can I get out of this person? What can I get out of Brandon Cole? Yeah, well, that's how everybody interacts with everybody. That's one of those things with Virgos from what I've read is that we project – we assume that the rest of the world thinks the way we do. Right. So, you know, I'm looking at everybody like, what does this person offer me? Like, why should I interact with this person? What do I have to gain from their friendship? Yeah. And not in like a, you know – exploitative way just in a why should i exert my energy way right so we assume that everybody thinks like that yeah whereas i and this probably doesn't have anything to do with my sign i don't really know you know i try to go out of my way to assist people when i can um that sort of thing i'd like to do more of it now there there's this circles back to kind of the restrictiveness say i'm on my way to work and i see somebody who just needs a ride or something Mm mm-hmm but they happen to will be walking the wrong way. Am I going to stop and offer them a ride? Probably not, because they're going the opposite way that I am. Yeah. Um, if they're going the same way, well, that really depends on how much time, how black they are. How? <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, well, if we're going to leave that one in there, I'm going to leave the woman one in there. <laughs> I don't really I mean, mean you that. said it. I know. I, I didn't say the black thing. The woman thing. Though. Mm. Yeah. History is decided by the winners, Remington. <laughs> but. Um, no, it's it's more dependent on how much time I have. And since I'm usually running close to late or late, then I usually don't stop to help somebody that way. Are you talking somebody you don't know? Yeah. Oh, okay. But I have been known to pick up strangers. So there's that. And during the power outage that we had a few years ago, I was leaving. This is before Ginger and I lived together. And I was living on Liber- Liberty Street? Yeah. Is that the one down? Or... Up the hill? No. That's Broad Street. That's Broad Street. Um, okay, then, yeah, it was with Kevin. Street. With Kevin. Oh, uh, 19th. 19th, okay. Uh, I had left Ginger's. She lived on South Side, and there was a dude. He was a fairly sketchy-looking dude, in fact, and he was walking, and he kind of flagged down for a ride. And we had that big power outage, and um, so I stopped, and I offered him a ride, and I took him over at least to, you know, round about where he wanted to go, because I didn't have anything to do except go home at that point. Yeah. You know, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, Oh, he flagged you down for a ride at two in the morning? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, man, whatever. So I went and I took him and it was no big deal. You know, he's like I said, he was a little sketchy, but he didn't scare me in any way. Of course, there were a couple of things that I thought of when he got into the car as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, number one, I, I always have something near me that I can use to defend myself if I need to. Yeah. Um, because I'm a Boy Scout and prepared like that. When he when he flagged me down, I pulled my Leatherman out. And I opened up the knife end and just stuck it down beside me to where he wouldn't be able to see it, but it was there. So if he starts attacking you, you're going straight for the throat, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But the other thing that I noticed is that I didn't put a seatbelt on. So the question is, is that if he went to attack me while we were driving, which would be stupid anyway. Yeah. And I couldn't get to my knife that was beside me. Well, I'll just wreck the car. Yeah. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a classic movie move, too. Yeah. Somebody's in the... And the car attacking, and they just speed it up and crash it into a tree or something? Yep. So, and they weren't wearing a seatbelt. So, I mean, if if I felt that my life was in danger, I had options. Yeah. So, that being said, I don't go into something like that without a plan, because I know people can be real scary nowadays. But then again, I'm a big dude. I've got a lot of strength to me. I'm, you know, even though I'm 
portly. I, mm-hmm. I still, if if my adrenaline gets pumping, I can do some crazy things. So I'm not super worried about much of anything. Yeah, just walking down the street, you're not concerned. No, nah, not really. Because the long and short of it is, is if somebody attacks me, well, then I'll f- try and fight them off, or I'll just give them whatever they want if they just, you know, because that doesn't bother me either. Yeah, I just. Oh, you want to take all the credit cards that I have? Okay, I'll just cancel them when... So really, you're just wasting your time. Because you're not going to be... I will rationalize this for this guy. I don't have any cash. I have credit cards that will be canceled as soon as you leave. Do you really want to mess with me? Or do you just want to go about your way and maybe I mean, you're rob stabbed. You're else? stabbed immediately. Yeah. As soon as you start to rationalize, well, I'm going to cancel these credit cards. Yeah. The only thing I have to give you, I'm immediately going to cancel. Yeah. You're just going to get stabbed. Well, I mean, I might get stabbed or he might just be like... Damn it. Okay. <laughs> Just go rob somebody else, dude. Look, look, look. That guy. He yeah, looks that, like he has he, cash. Yeah, he's probably got cash. I don't. Here, take my Leatherman. Just bring it back when you're done. Yeah, exactly. Wipe, wipe the prints off of it, for God's sake. Use your brain. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be robbing people. There's at least don't get caught. dictatorial Capricorn <laughs> <Exactly>. again. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to email you the script on how to rob him. <laughs> and I want you to make any corrections to it and get it back to me. By tomorrow. Exactly. And I'll tell him to meet at the same time, same place, so he can get robbed. You know, it'll all work out. I promise. But the robbery probably won't start until two hours late because I got to get Skype working. And <laughs> it keeps dropping out on me. My fucking computer needed to update right now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. So the reason I was reading those partially. Okay. <laughs> now that we've gone way off track was I wanted to get your opinion on what you felt like as far as which of those descriptions actually hit you, which ones actually seem to be true or not. Which I think we did when, when we were talking about them though, like the dicto- dictatorial. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so that's going to go into my point here in just a few after we finish up here about the science of horoscopes and the science of Zodiac Okay, and the science of whether it really whether there's a truth to it. Okay. Which is where we're going to end this on. Gotcha. So I want to hit up while we're going. This is my last little bit of Western mytho- Western astrology stuff. Okay. One of the more seminal figures in Western astrology is William Lilly. Okay. Who wrote a book called Christian Anthology in 1647 that was published. Okay. It's considered one of the most important and seminal books on Western astrology. So the book is split into three subgroups. You have Volume 1, An Introduction to Astrology, Volume 2, The Resolution of All Manners of Questions and Demands, Okay. and Volume 3, An Easy and Plain Method, How to Judge Upon Nativities. Okay. Nativities meaning natal astrology, which is um, astrology based on your birth date and your birth time. Okay. So whenever you see astrology that's like, you're, you're in this house, you have the sign, your 12 signs, your 12 houses, when you get like a a full natal birth chart. Right. That's the nativities. Yeah. Gotcha. So his book outlines almost all of what we use as far as birth charts and shit like that. Okay. And he also goes into horary astrology. Okay. Which I think you mentioned earlier. Horoscopic. They might be two different things. I don't know. Horary astrology is basically constructing a horoscope based on the exact time the question is asked. Okay. So horary astrology is like, I ask you, you know, uh, one of the examples I read, I think on Wikipedia of where's my dog? My dog went missing. Where's my dog? Okay. You as the astrologist note the exact time that question was asked and then do kind of a chart for where all the stars are in the sky and use divination to discover an answer. That gotcha. Way. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, you can, with the length of time it takes to do this shit, you can tell me where my dog is in about three days. Right. Exactly. And, and I... We'll get into that. Is it, are you about done with that then? Yeah, that's all that I was... I just needed – you can't really talk about Western astrology and where, where I'm leading into without mentioning William Lilly. That's really a good segue into the Chinese side of it. I divined uh-huh. that you would need a perfect segue at that point. Well, it was. Because Jupiter was ascending. Yeah. And uh, Mars was descending. Yeah. And the stars were in alignment okay. with China. You're just – you're just making shit up. China the wrestler. Yes. Rest her in peace. Yes. So anyway, in Chinese astrology, it can be traced back as early as 2000 BCE. So, I mean, we're talking right down there with the Babylonians. Yeah. But it was 
more explored and fleshed out during the Zhao dynasty, running from 1046 all the way up to 256 BCE. So, I mean, very long span of time on that one. Several ideals were brought together during the Han dynasty, and Chinese astrology joined the philosophical ranks of Chinese medicine, uh, divinity, elemental theory, the yin and yang philosophy, and Confucian morality. So that's when it really kind of cemented itself into Chinese dogma. Okay. The zodiac system is an amalgamation of Chinese philosophies such as the Four Pillars of Destiny, uh, the 12 year cycle that features an animal for each year. Uh, these animals are associated with either a yin or a yang and a fixed element such as earth, fire, wind, or earth, fire, wood, water, or metal. Earth, fire, wood, water. Okay. I thought air was in there too, but I think I was wrong. Uh, that would be the, wind, right? Huh? Uh, earth, fire, wood, water, or metal. Earth, fire, wood, water, metal. Yeah. So that would be five. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So. Uh, wind was not in the elements on that one, I guess. These years can be broken into months, giving someone their inner animal. So you have your outer animal, which is the year that you were born in. And that runs on a 12-month cycle. So the rat age, or the year of the rat runs all of, so say like 1924 into 1925 was the year of the rat. And... There are 12 of them, so that starts over in the 13th year is the year of the rat again. Okay. Okay? They use the same system for the months. I, as you're talking, I don't want you to... I have my phone in my face, but I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm looking at uh, Zodi Chinese Zodiac notes as well. Okay. I don't want you to think I'm just like <laughs> tuning <laughs> right. you out and like checking Facebook. Yeah. So, yeah, they use that a 12-year cycle for uh, animal for each of the years. And then they also use that same system for month, which gives someone their inner animal. So you have your outer animal, which is your year you were born, your inner animal, which is whatever month you were born in, your day of the week, giving you your true animal, and even down to the hour, which gives you your secret animal. <laughs> okay. So the 12 animals are grouped into four groups of three called trines, each possessing their own set of traits. And each breakdown coincides that, those four groups, with uh, the four pillars philosophy. Okay. So, do you, need, do you need to know what the four pillars are? Yeah. Let's drop them in here. You were born in 83? Yes. Uh, you... Rat. I, no. Boar, I think. You're the water pig. Yeah. And I'm the wood rat. Uh, four pillars method can be traced back to the Han Dynasty. Again, we're going back to the Han Dynasty. Uh, it's used quite a bit in feng shui astrology. The four pillars or four columns chart is called such as the Chinese writing causes it to fall into columns. This is straight from Wikipedia. Each pillar or column contains a stem and a branch, and each column relates to the year, month, day, and hour of birth. The first column refers to the year, animal, and element. The second column to the month, animal, and element. The third... Uh, day animal element and the last hour and out element within the four pillars the year column purports to provide information about one's ancestor or early age the month column about one's parents or growing age the day column information about one's self your upper character and one's spouse lower character or adult age and the hour column about children or late age <laughs> Wow. Did I lose you on that one? Yeah. Yeah. Almost immediately. Burmese sounds even more complicated, which is why I was trying to avoid talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it goes back to what you were saying about the Grecian astrology, where you were talking about days and hours as well. Mm -hmm. So, where you were talking about an astrologer noting the hour of the question and, and using that to. So, we see a lot of that in Chinese astrology. Where you have an animal, not just for the year you were born, but the month, the day, and the hour as well. Yeah. So, and that all falls into the four pillars philosophy. And that's what dictates your traits. There and that is... sounds like a great segue for you. <laughs> so, the thing that interested me the most about this, all of this, and the question I had was, is it true? Is any of this true? Right. Is there any scientific basis at 
all for this? And the answer is no, not really. We forever have been using this to try to tell the future. Right. Because we were able to. Early on, we could, quote, tell the future by knowing when the Nile was going to flood. Right. By knowing when it was going to start to get cold, knowing when there was going to be an eclipse. Yeah. And that's where astrology and astronomy kind of split is when astronomy started to say, no, we're just going to study the movement and be able to tell that kind of stuff. And astrology continued on with, no, but by these movements, we can tell the future. Yeah. So a lot of, and I'm going now with the modern Zodiac. Okay. A lot of the Zodiac is based off of confirmation bias. Believing in the Zodiac, believing in your horoscope is a perfect example of confirmation bias. Okay. Uh, which is reinforcing beliefs you already hold. So if I believe that I'm an artistic person, I'm an analytical person, might be a little skeptical and I might be a little cold, I read my description of Virgo and I hit it hits those points. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I am that. I am that. And then the stuff that doesn't affect me, like clean. Virgos are supposed to be very clean. I'm not a clean person. I'm a messy person. Yes. I ignore that. Well, you know, the Virgo stuff, it's not 100%. There's no way it can be 100% accurate. Right. You know, just like with your um your stuff. There's some things that fit you. There's some things that don't. Yeah. So whenever you're looking at a breakdown of the Zodiac and they get into the natal birth charts of, well, what hour were you born? Yeah, Capricorn stuff might not fit you exactly because you weren't born in this particular you were, hour. Yeah, you were born at 4 p.m. And I, I read, I don't have the notes here. I meant to put it down and I don't even remember where they are now. But uh, there were, it might have even been in the Chinese one, but where just certain parts of the day, because it was a different animal, dictated different traits. So, yeah, that might very well be, you know, that... Uh, again, confirmation bias of, oh, well, yeah, you were born during this part of the day, so that makes you, your your secret person, a rat, even though you're a pig. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it seems to be this shotgun approach. Yeah. Of even as you get into the minute details, because the argument, it's, it's hundreds of dollars to get a real astrological reading with like your birth chart done. Right. With your signs and your rising this and your falling this or descending this or whatever. But even within those people who do that, there's no one clear cut way to do those readings. Yeah. If you have something like this that's almost based off of like, this is fact, give me hundreds of dollars and we will predict the future. I will tell you who you are and what your future is and where your fortune lies, which is what these purport to do. Yeah. There would be a standard for it. There would be – if they're saying that it's all based on science, then there would be a standard every one of them would follow. Right. Right? Right. Otherwise, it's really no different than a super complicated way to look at tea leaves. Yeah. But confirmation bias is based on two things. It's based on cognitive mechanisms, which is heuristics, the mind's predilection to focus on one aspect of a complex problem and ignoring others. So that's – um, you know, you're looking at your horoscope and it says you will meet somebody important today or whatever. You go out and you have a real shitty day, but the barista at Starbucks is all right to you. They're not nice. Right. You focus on that one point. You skip the rest of the horoscope that says, you know, you're going to find a stray dog in your car and it's going to throw up on your leg and it's going to have him hundred dollars in its vomit <laughs> or whatever it is. Our mind breaks complex problems down into more digestible things right so looking at these horoscopes helps us to break it down uh of course that being said the more convoluted the horoscope then the easier it is to hit a point that'll make you feel good about it yes yeah because that's how our mind works yeah it's also also part of the cognitive mechanism is that it fi our brains find it hard to test other hypotheses Mm -hmm. which is, you know, the whole you can't – it's hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Right. If you already believe something, it's the classic, you know, the political debates about everything. Like, well, I don't think that person X should get this. I don't think they should have gay marriage or whatever, or this or that. Almost anybody who has a gay family member at some point is going to turn and be like, well, I guess not all gay people are bad. Because until you're able to fold that into your own way of thinking – you have this cognitive mechanism of confirmation bias. Right. The other part is the motivated mechanism, which is basically what's called the Pollyanna principle, 
which means people prefer pleasant thoughts over unpleasant thoughts on default. So when we're looking at these horoscopes, we want to assume not only that the good parts hit us, but even when you read horoscopes, the bad parts, the things that you're like, uh, a Virgo's lazy or a Virgo's overly critical or, you know, a uh, Capricorn is dictatorial. Those are still spawn as not bad things. Yeah. You know, like you can be a dictator, but it's because you work so hard. Right. And you just want to hold other people to your standards. Yes. That's a big appeal of it. There was a research paper done. It was about a 20 year research paper. It was by two guys, Jeffrey Dean and Ivan Kelly. Okay. Who were scientists or writers or something. I only wrote and down lovers. their names. Hopefully. <laughs> I didn't uh, take too much on them. They did a research paper that was kind of published. That's why I'm only touching on this for a second because it's kind of strange. Okay. They released a hypothesis and a bit of a research paper in, I think, 2003. Okay. That was a multi-year, 15, 20-year study on twins. Okay. And they studied twins from the time of birth for like 15, 20 years and watched how their um, behavior – and their way of thinking didn't match up with their zodiac sign. Okay. So they were testing the principle of if two twins are born at the exact same time, at the exact same date, under the zodiac guidelines, they will have the same characteristics. Right. And they didn't. The thing that's weird is this paper, they introduced the hypothesis. So like, you know, 10 pages or five pages of this paper that's supposed to be this huge thing. And then just never wrote anything else about it. Huh. And the astrology community was up in arms about it. A lot of people – I read a lot of astrology sites that were besmirching these guys, yeah. of course, because they're trying to prove something that you believe that's wrong. So I read a little bit of the paper, but it didn't give any actual data. It just said, here's what we tested, here's what we found, but it didn't break down you know, the numbers. Yeah. So I don't know if that study is actually accurate, so I don't want to use it 100%. Right. Gotcha. I did find in this – I wanted to just copy this article whole hog, oh, <laughs> and really? I'm not going to, but this – I read this thing back to back. It's maybe like 10, 15 pages long, and it's one of the most well-written things about astrology. It was exactly what I was looking for. Gotcha. So this is from the website sillybeliefs.com, <laughs> which by itself is an adorable name. Yeah. But a astronomer, Michael E. Backich or Backick – who is the – at the time of this article is the associate editor of Astronomy Magazine. OK. Writes this article, Astrology Factor Fiction, and breaks it down and it's just fantastic. This is where I learned a lot of stuff about the celestial equator. This is where I learned about um, precession. Yeah. Which I think you mentioned yeah, where the earth the, wobbles. the wobble on the axis, yeah. So – That was originally uh, founded by Hipparchus. Who, who initially discovered that wobble. So Aries is the first sign because it was the sign that when all of this was originally done was the sign that was the sun was in the quadrant during the vernal equinox. Right. That's not the case anymore. Right. And we have stuff to talk about on that. The zodiac shift, as it were. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that this astronomer argues, I think argues well, is that you can't base – how can you base it off of when you were born and the pull of the stars if that star is no longer in your date? Like maybe at one point Virgo was August 22nd to September 22nd, but at this point Virgo is not in the sky during those dates anymore. So somebody born, you know, September 10th would be considered a Virgo because of zodi zodiacal? Zodiological? Zodiological. Sounds good. Because of the zodiological sign – but the star, the constellation of Virgo, is not influencing them at all. Right. If it even were to influence them. Right. And that brings us to, you know, over over many years now, um, there have been articles, especially the, you know, now that the internet is such a big thing, um, talking about how NASA will occasionally say, well, you know, there's, there's not, the, the Zodiac doesn't really matter anymore. And and they all seem to blame it on NASA because NASA is the big science, space, and technology entity. Oh, well, NASA is never a straight answer. Yeah. I guess I probably shouldn't say that. Yeah, since you work for NASA. Yeah. But uh, they, I can't believe none of my NASA information has even come up or really been brought up in this whole thing about astronomers. Yeah, right? <laughs> 
But, um, well, that's because we're talking about astrology, which isn't real, right? Yeah. 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 But, um, so, and, and it's even happened recently where they say, look, the the signs that you know, they don't exist in the same time. And what about this other constellation, this 13th constellation? And you'll see references uh, out there referencing a 13th sign. Um, how do we say it again? I totally don't remember. <laughs> Isn't it Ophicus? No. Ophicus. O Fia Cus. Ophiacus. <laughs> no. You sure it's not Ophiacus? Yes. Ophiacus? Ophi. Ophiucus. Orpheus. Ophiucus. 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 So yeah, 13th sign Ophiucus. Um, it's the 13th constellation, you know. What uh, what bearing does it have? And it's funny that you bring up an article that's you know saying, well, this isn't the way it is. So this is from this is an article from the Collective Evolution, and it's uh, by Carmen De Lucio, uh, released just back in September 2016. No, your astrological sign has not shifted. Why NASA's updated zodiac is wrong. Um, basically, what she says is that. From a celestial point of view, yes, that zodiac is wrong. Yes, NASA, you are correct in saying that our planet has shifted and that those signs are not correct anymore. But that has no bearing on, and we're circling all the way back to, the tropical zodiac. Mm -hmm. And what she purports to say in this is that, listen... We know that the positioning of the stars in the constellations shift by one degree every 72 years because of precession. We know this. We give that to you. It was discovered all the way back in 127 BC by Hipparchus, or however you want to say that. Hip-hop. Hip-hop. Uh, during, and I'm going to go ahead and just read some of this verbatim. During the 2nd century AD, the awareness of precession became popularized by the historical figure Ptolemy. Uh, he clarified that the zodiac they were using, as in the Greeks, was a tropical coordinate system. The cardinal signs are to always stay aligned with the equinoxes and the solstices, which is also the start of each season. This allowed the zodiac to be evenly distributed and centered around the relationship of the sun. There are three signs per season. The cardinal signs are the first... Then we have fixed signs, which are locked in the middle of the seasons, and finally mutable signs that are the last sign before transitioning to the next. Mutable signs have adaptive qualities, which make sense for a sign that leads us to the next season. So basically what she's saying is that from a Grecian astrology point of view, it stopped being about the location of the constellations and more about where those were in regard to our season on the planet. Okay. So that doesn't change because they basically pulled it out of space and put it on the planet. The planet itself doesn't change. So that's why we still say there are 12, not 13. You know, they, the dates don't change because it's all been pulled back to this planet using our measurement of time. Yeah. And location. So it's all just this way for us to explain it in a consistent way right there's so much stuff changing constantly in the universe and things that we don't know and things that we're going to discover that the easiest way for the zodiac to make sense to people is to just say like well just ignore a lot of this ignore the parts that we think will make you question it too much yes and no because i mean they she makes a an interesting point that the greeks knew all of this all the way back in the day so that's why they pulled it back to a, a planetary thing where it's based on our season solstices and stuff like that. Yeah. So this is I'm going to read one or two points from this guy's article here. OK. And then we'll wrap up. OK, sure. Here's a couple points that hit me that I really liked. No one true way to name the constellations exists. They can be whatever our imaginations come up with. We name constellations to map the skies and jog our memories about earthly occurrences. Capricornus, for example, was given the form of a mountain goat because 4,000 years ago this constellation was climbing high into the sky as the sun was reaching its greatest height. It was also the start of the rainy season, so the Chaldeans added a fish's tail and Capricornus became that mythical beast, the sea goat. When yeah, modern, the goat fish! When modern humans named the constellations, imagination seemed to wane. 
Much of the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear, is now known more commonly as the Big Dipper, and Sagittarius the Archer is reduced to a common teapot. Under a modern system of astrology, would people born under the sign of the teapot be short, stout, and frequently blow off steam? (laughs) So what he's saying there is we ascribe these tendencies and these characteristics to the constellations. You know, Virgos, again, are supposed to be very pure and very uh, simple as far as uh, their wants and needs and things like that, but also very graceful, is all based off of this arbitrary thing that we name this constellation hundreds of thousands, hundreds if not thousands of years ago. Right. And there's one more point here. Okay, this is one more point here. I know this is kind of out of order, but I didn't want to write these quotes down because it takes forever to write things by hand. (laughs) So he's discussing here um, the idea that these... The forces of the stars and the planets and the moons and the gravitational pull, all of this affects our personality in some way. Right. Consider a baby at the moment of birth, the critical time in the production of a horoscope. Modern scientific theory enables us to compute not only the positions of the planets in the sky, but the intensity of all known forces and radiation absorbed by child at birth. The walls of the hospital block most of the radiation from the sun and stars. Even if they didn't, the lights in the delivery room far outshine any stellar radiation. In addition, the building exerts about 10 times more gravitational pull than all eight planets combined, 500,000 times more than the nearest star beyond the sun. Thus, the forces and radiation from space that fall on us at birth are overwhelmed by counterparts within our own environment. Okay. So, all of that said, I think horoscopes and astrology is fun to read yeah but i don't really believe in it right so really my opinion is exactly what i said it was last time we recorded (laughs) (laughs) exactly and is your has your opinion changed at all or anything about it no uh ultimately this was just a fun exercise in in exploring something that we didn't know much about and i think it's interesting to challenge what we think we know with uh things that we may not know so that's that's one of the reasons why occasionally we'll do these theme episodes anyway. It's just just to make ourselves more knowledgeable about something that we find interesting. Yeah, and to break up the just watching movie trailers every other week. <laughs> exactly. Because God, who cares? Right, totes. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that was a good episode, Brandon. I think so. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this. If you'd like to hear more random, I mean, we'll do them more often if you want us to. Yeah. You know, if there if there's a topic that you'd like for us to wax on about, then you can leave a comment, you know, let us know. Give us a call. So and we'll get on all that here in a minute. Yeah. So do you have any uh, final thoughts or anything? You already did your ones for astrology. So final thoughts on what? I don't just know. Anything just in general. I mean, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going forward with. The podcast 100 episodes yeah i mean we kind of did this last episode at the end of 2016 also but yeah thanking everybody and all of yeah that. and that was a good close to the year so we're looking forward to bringing a whole lot more in this next year um hopefully we can get schedules way more dialed in and and, and bring some more consistency to it That's there's ultimately what i'd like to do is, is have some more consistency when it comes down to it for me being a virgo and <laughs> As planned as I'm supposed to be, my life has been like a fucking roller coaster of chaos this last month. Yeah, it has. And it has been difficult to get here and do the episode with the right kind of enthusiasm and excitement. Right. That I always bring. The, <laughs> always. The charm, the panache, the uh, chutzpah. Chutzpah. Yeah, yeah. All of that. So. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have a couple of call-ins that I'm going to play for you guys. Uh, this is... Viscount Terry Irvin the second. All right, and then after that we will have Stephen Hines as well. We're just and, gonna play him back to back, and we're just gonna play him back to back. Let you guys listen to him, basically just congratulating us on a hundred episodes. So. To quote George Clinton, they are basically kissing us on our ego. Yep. Hey, this is uh, Viscount or Viscount or Viscount Terry. However you and your audience want to pronounce it. Anyway, I'm calling to congratulate you on your hundredth podcast podcast episode this is a you know this is a milestone says quite a bit about you and your commitment to the ongoing project and your audience also i wanted to let you and your listeners know mostly your listeners that there's a minor reference or shout out to dueling ogres and thunderwells and beyond that i wanted to thank you for doing what you can to help promote uh, my newest novel 
But that said, I'm looking forward to listening through to episodes 200 and 500 and beyond. So keep it up. Take care and keep up the good work. Bye. Thank you very much, Terry, for that. We really appreciate it. Yeah. That, yeah, that one was super nice. It was. Like it was that. really nice. And uh, a shout out in Thunderwells? Yeah. That's cool. Maybe when our copies get here, we'll be able to uh, suss it out, what it is. Because I want to find it without him telling me what it is. Yeah. You know? That's more fun that way. So, And now we have Stephen Hines. Uh, Stephen Hines, of course, we had on the Diamond Man, Stephen Hines, mm-hmm. as we continue to forget to call him. Yeah. Well, because it's fucking stupid. I love the name. <laughs> I just never remember The it. Diamond jerk, Man? The no. Diamond Man. I like it. He likes it, too. Why do you gotta be such a negative Nancy? You smelly Virgo. It's a classic Virgo move. Yeah, classic Virgo. <laughs> <laughs> You're stupid. You're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Hold on, wait. Yeah. What'd you say? Oh. I thought that was like a record scratch. Yeah, that that's like a full on. Yeah, that was like it's a full on funk thing. Okay, never yeah. Mind. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> God, Jesus, will you put that away so I can move on? <laughs> you jerk, you smelly bastard. Yeah, I'm um, done. I will not use this again for the rest of the episode. I promise. Okay. <laughs> so Stephen Hines. Uh, also left us one, and he's been working on the next installment of Zombie Fabulous, I think. Yeah. So he's been working on that. I know he said that he had a little bit of writer's block, and then he had this flood of, of creative juices that hit. So here is Steven's congratulations for 100 episodes. Hey, you two magnificent bastards. This is Steven Hines. Just wanted to congratulate you on reaching show 100. It's an awesome um, you know, special momentous occasion. So I hope you are going to broadcast nude and, uh, go audio only. Um, okay, bye. <laughs> Steven bringing the enthusiasm that he is so well known for. I love the K bye. <laughs> K <Okay>, bye. <laughs> um, in disclosure, we did listen to these ahead of time. Yep. So we knew what they were. So, Stephen, as per your request, we are completely nude. Yes, 110% nude. Yeah. And we have been nude the entire time. That's right. <laughs> only we took video of it, and the only way to get it is to pay us $100. <sighs> yeah. I know, but it'll be all right. It'll be exactly. all right. Exactly. So if you have any questions or comments or you'd like to hear yourself on air, you can call us at 978-DU-OGRES. That's 978 978- Three eight six four seven three seven. You can also reach us on Twitter at Dueling Ogres. Email us at DuelingOgres at gmail.com or leave a comment on the Facebook page. Um, shout outs. Um, as we were recording, we got a message from the Wizard in the Wardrobe, Keisha, on okay. Facebook, who congratulated us on 100 episodes as well. Keisha also commented uh, wanting to know what we thought about her being a Scorpio. So do you want to you want to pull up? She wants to know what we would find out on that other than she's dark and mysterious. Uh, let's see what I got here on Scorpios real quick. OK, so Keisha is based off of the Scorpions, the band. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, she's loyal, resourceful, observant, but also jealous, obsessive and manipulative. <laughs> I would say from what I know of her, all of those things apply. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah, I would say so. Um, but in a good way. She's a water element. Yeah. Um, <laughs> More like an ice queen. Uh-huh. Am I right? I, am, am I right, Brandon? I got to find your thing. What's it called? Pocket sitcom. Pocket sitcom. Am I right, Brandon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cram. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I feel like you are way over what I did. I use the pocket sitcom tastefully. Yeah, I don't use anything tastefully, Brandon. I am a large, heavy set brute, and I do nothing with ease. <laughs> uh, Terry commented on episode 99, saying that he can understand your comment about having seen Blade Runner years after the release. I didn't see any of the, these comments. 
Yeah, you're really running behind. And know that you weren't impressed, mostly because it influenced many movies that followed, and it didn't appear to be newer cutting territory. Okay. He said he got the same thing, but in reverse with the novel The Giver, which seems to have elements derived from so many novels and even movies that came before. But for my students and younger readers, it was all new. And then he also commented uh, with a video of the final scene, Tears in the Rain, uh, Blade Runner. It's all just tears in rain. In the rain. Yeah. So, which we had a little discussion about that. It was pretty good. All we are is dust. All we in are the is dust in the wind. A hundred episodes in, still have not figured out how to end this episode. Any of them. What do you mean? How to end the episodes properly? I know exactly how to end the episodes. Without devolving into singing Dust in the Wind and pocket <laughs> sitcoms. and <laughs> That's what makes us us, Brandon. So make sure to check out our website at Dueling Ogres for articles pertaining to some of your favorite geek news. If you'd like to contribute, you can email us at bloggers at duelingogres.com. We have one that will be coming up soon from Mumphrey once he gets it finished and edited. Mm-hmm. You can read several that uh, Terry has done for us over the past few weeks that are up now. And I made a promise to the dictatorial Remington that I would try to write an article a month. Yes. So you can look forward to, to this month. those having, fillers. Having and Brandon have a month. Uh, a month. An article a month. A month of Brandon. You should, you should make it a game. You should be like, yeah, it should be like a month of Brandon. Of you <laughs> into the life of Brandon. What do I do? I don't know. You can do whatever. It's your articles. You don't think the owners of the website are going to care? No, I think they'll be fine with it. I've heard that the one guy's a real asshole. I think I think I've heard he's a real dictator. That's a real sure. prick. A real smelly, a fat real piece so of and shit. So. A real, real son of a bitch. A real ugly whore. A real <laughs> tasteless vagabond. <laughs> And finally, be sure to leave us a five-star <laughs> review on iTunes. Yeah, after that, definitely leave us a fucking five-star review. Find us on Podbean, <laughs> iHeartRadio, Satchel, where you can donate to the show, or nearly anywhere else you can find a podcast. So until next week, Ogres, keep your clubs blunt. And your tusks sharp. Good night. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right, we're done. Oh, I should have been Ah, uh, you're a failure. smelly failure i open up my facebook and the first fucking thing i see is joe doyle leaving this on my facebook wall (laughs) i don't even talk to him (laughs) at all (laughs) that's so funny oh geez we can just call him on air (laughs) hey you're on air right now with dueling errors and we were just wondering if it'd be okay for us to use that's your horoscope for today for our ending theme song sure what the hell was that was that a ghost (laughs) <laughs> sure that's weird al's agent it's whimsical so apparently william morris is a ghost agent is that who his agent is mm-hmm. did you know that or do you just know it from the information on the site i just know it from the information on the site the, the business is called william morris endeavor which is weird al's agent mm. daddy yes are you still in here what are you doing child you enjoy that outside buddy you'll never be in it no no you might He's a little skittish. All right, Brandon. No. We ready to make like a Zodiac and 30 degree out of here? Cat needs out. It's like the future vape. You like the light with it? I do. It's very... I can change the color. You can. I can do the same thing with my keyboard. Do it. Can you change it to any color on that color spectrum? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Mine only does five. Yours is way cooler. What? I can do a fucking spiral rainbow on my keyboard. Can you just do that the whole time? Yeah, it'll just go. It'll go forever like that. That's awesome. My sister got this for me for Christmas. Really? Yeah. We didn't even have a Christmas in my family. Oh, 
man. That's they just burnt down the tree. That's hard. In front of us. That's hard. <laughs> it is. Um, ooh, that one's nice. So each individual key can light up too. Yeah. So could you set it up where only certain keys are lit? Like, does it have that level of um, no, customization? But it, no, but it does have uh, like typing keys. So that one lights up and it fades out. Uh, that's fucking awesome. Hmm. Or I can do ripple. Huh. And then you can get the other, uh, like, there are other devices, like there's a headset and I think a mic or something, mm-hmm. or my head mic, or headset mic combo, that as you talk, it, it sends signals to the keyboard to make different lighting effects and stuff like that. <clears throat> I don't have those. Do you have a favorite set? Yeah, but I didn't save it. I didn't figure as I ran through it, it would lose it. It's okay. I guess your keyboard can't do everything. Well, I could have if I just would have remembered to save it. Ooh, I like that one. It's like Christmas lights. <laughs> It'd be super distracting almost all the time. Yeah, constantly. It's a pretty fast pulse. I like the slow because otherwise it is pretty distracting. Yeah. I like it real slow, girl. Yeah. On my keyboards, I mean. All the ladies in the house say yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Fucking don't die, Brandon. <laughs> I know. I'm going to... I feel like shit. You should probably, like, see a doctor or something. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I should. My God. That's your horoscope. I mean, we can see it ourselves, right? That's your horoscope for today. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Horoscopes yeah, yeah, yeah. and zodiacs and everybody has future. Yeah. Weird Al. Gonna sing my song about the zodiac. Mm-mm-mm. Aries and Aquarius and Pisces, too. Weird Al songs, everybody, yeah, what, Uh (laughs) (laughs) uh-oh. What, Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Zodiac. Now you may find it inconceivable, or at the very least a bit unlikely, that the relative positions of the planets and the stars could have a special deep significance or meaning that exclusively applies to only you, but let me give you my assurance that these forecasts and predictions are all based on solid scientific documented evidence, so you must be some... Wait, fuck. I messed it up. Oh, man, I almost got through the whole thing. Mine was better. And Virgo's constellation. And that's another sign. <laughs> zodiac. Heart attack. You're a maniac. It's a Zodiac. I kind of like that, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this really turned it into a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've been working with Kesha. <laughs> <laughs> like dollar sign or regular? Regular Kesha. Okay. She doesn't affect the dollar sign until she uh releases a new single yeah can i get a video of you doing that do you think you can repeat do a repeat performance of that i don't know I love that. Uh, let me tell me when you're ready for me to start. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, it's time for my vocal warm ups. Okay, ready? Okay, I think I'm good. Wait. <laughs> That's so stupid looking. <laughs> That's, That's That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yep, I'm definitely going to do it in Inkwell. <laughs> it's when you get the, like, deepness there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's so dumb. Oh, yeah, God, that's so dumb. Don't put that on the episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is going out live. What? <laughs> 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 you Tim allen me. <laughs> Yo, you Tim allen me over here. Yeah. Wow. You know what? I feel like more than anything else, 
the world is missing more hippie girls with Etsy shops. There's not enough of them. Because, you know, it's hard to find more places to buy old mason jars with shit painted on them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we need more of those, too. You like my new notebook I've been using? I got it for Christmas. That is very cool. It's embossed. Oh, my, it is. Well, don't. It's an overlay. Don't go breaking my heart. Open it up to the first page. Oh, that's cool. It folds out into a full-page comic. Oh, really? Oh, neat. Property of dudes. I think there's a comic on the other side, too. I'm going through the little rat bots. Oh, it's got like a little sleeve in it. That's cool. You can put <clears throat> you can put stuff in there, Brandon. You can put other notes. My accoutrement. Your accoutrement. My accoutrement. The only problem with those, with any of them, is that the binding is always so cheap. Like, as nicely made as that thing is, mm -hmm. the pages are going to fall out so quick. You yeah. just can't get a good bound book in America. You need to go to Singapore for the good book bindings. Yeah. The binderies. Yeah, I understand completely. It even has a little marker. Did you know that? No. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out to be the binding of the book. <laughs> you just rip it out. <laughs> See? Now you have a, a bookmark. Oh, it's the color of the turtle's... Sashes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Boop. There you go. Now your book is marked. Yay. Thanks, Ram. You're welcome. I find out things for you all the time. You do. I'm like a... A finder of A things. sage. You're like a... I'm a, I'm a sage of wisdom. A sage. A sage, sage of wisdom. Sage. I'm from Naruto. You're sage. I'm from Naruto. I'm your sage. Usagi. Usagi. Usagi or usage? I don't know. Usagi. Is it, is it usagi? Usagi Ujimbo. Oh, well, yeah, but that's... I mean, we can circle back to turtles there. No. Yojimbo. Yusage Yojimbo, that was the rabbit's name, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm hmm? Yeah, so we circled back to the turtles. Even though he had his own comic. <laughs> Technically, he, was, he had his own comic first. Yeah, yeah. He was first. He just appeared in the turtles. In the, in, on the series. I still have my uh, Usage Yojimbo toy. That's cool. My action figure. Hmm... It's good stuff, Brandon. Yeah, this is all gold. I don't know why we just don't put a stamp on this episode and call it. Yeah, totally. Uh, we should do that. We should do all those things. We should do all those things. Video up on our Instagram slash Facebook slash Twitter. You can see my process for vocal warm-ups. I love that it comes in a focus, too. I think that's my favorite thing about that. Yeah. Well, it's cause, um, partially because my phone has a 13 megapixel camera. Yeah. As opposed to mine that has like a five. Mm -hmm. I am amazed that you were able to finish that with a straight face. Oh, really? That is impossible for me to do. I cannot <laughs> do something like that and then not laugh. Yeah. That you could do that and then just finish with like, okay, I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you saw, I had to literally cover, cover my your mouth, mouth with yeah. my hand to not laugh in the background. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If, I think even the camera is kind of shuddering a little bit because you were... Trying to stifle your laughter. <laughs> just seeing it without audio is just as good. <laughs> you really see the build up there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just stop. Just stop. That's funny. All right. Um, but his most historical accomplishment. Try that again without slurring my words. This is a historical couple. <laughs>